2018. Um, we have a very distinguished, distinguished panel here. Before we start, just um, please make sure that all your cell phones are turned to silent. Um, also, a quick reminder about the music tonight. Um, there's an amazing music session at 4 p.m., 5 p.m., sorry, at, um, um, at uh, Hotel Clark Samir. Um, the heartbeat of a generation, how a family made the world's way to their percussive genius. A conversation between Grammy Award winner Viku Vinayakaram, his son Selva Ganesh, and his grandson Swami Nathan. This, it will be a fascinating session. So uh, if you can, get over there. And then there's great music to follow after that as well. Um, our next session um, on literary biographies. Uh, please welcome to the stage for highly distinguished biographers, uh, Andrea Di Robilant, Jenny Uglo, Zachary Leader, in conversation with Patrick French. Uh, you noticed how all of us were hesitant to come first onto the stage. Even though none of us come from Lucknow, uh, we've got one from uh, Italy, one from England, one from England originally from America, and then uh, one from, uh, let's say, Delhi slash Ahmedabad, but originally from England. But I think that uh, there's a particular tradition of biography that is represented within the sphere of literary uh, biography. So what I'd like to do to begin with is just to ask each person to say uh, how they conceive of the last literary biography that they wrote. Uh, and I'm saying that really just to establish in the mind of the audience for anybody who has uh, not read Jenny, Zach, Andrea, or my own books, just so you know roughly sort of who we're, we're talking about. So, um, Andrea, do you want to begin with, uh, I guess, Hemingway? Yeah, and, and the idea was to tell what exactly? What, what were you doing in the biography? Well, it's, uh, or, or, or what were you doing in the book about Ernest Hemingway? Right. Okay. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. It's very, very nice to hear. When, when um, uh, our presenter was mentioning the, the, the mu music this evening, I, I thought she was referring to the birds all around, all around here. Um, uh, anyway, yes, Hemingway. Well, um, as I was saying to our friends here before, before stepping on, I, I, I sort of accidentally stumbled into this uh, biographical book. It's not properly a biography of Hemingway. There are plenty of those around, and I certainly didn't want to measure myself to, to, to those books. The, the, I think they're... Uh, but, but I did want to tell a, a story about his life that I thought was important to tell, right? And so uh, it is uh, Hemingway late in life. Well, uh, he thought it was late in life. It wasn't that late in life. He was just about to turn 50 years old. Um, and he was at a time in his life of great crisis. He was um, on his fourth marriage. The marriage wasn't doing very well. They were living in Cuba. And they decided to come to Europe uh, uh, to sort of regenerate not only their marriage, but also Hemingway's creative life. He hadn't published a novel in nearly 10 years and was uh, uh, really at a very critical stage in his life. But do you want to just mention the key aspect of the relationship that to an extent changed his life? Yes, that in... in uh, in Venice, he meets um, an 18-year-old girl, a lovely, lovely girl by the name of Adriana. Uh, he falls d deeply in love with this girl. He was, as I said, just about to turn 50. And uh, this relationship, uh, I think, uh, I thought at the time when I read the correspondence that I was able to, uh, to, to read, uh, it, it really regenerated his creative life and allowed him to complete his life's work uh, and to then go on and win the Pulitzer Prize and the Nobel Prize, etc. But I don't think that we would have seen that Hemingway without Adriana, and that's what really led me 
to say, I, I think this story needs to be told. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, so, Zach Leader, if I can go to you now. Um, you have written um, books that are more, let's say, in the line of substantial literary biographies, physically. They're, they're very much coming out of a certain uh, biographical or literary biographical tradition. Um, perhaps a little similar to my own books in that you, you take writers who uh, some people regard as difficult and then you put them into one or two big uh, volumes. Yeah. Oh. Well, um, I too am uh, honored to be here, grateful to be here. It's a terrific festival. Um, my biography is different from Andrea's. It's, uh, as Patrick says, it's uh, more traditional, a cradle to grave uh, narrative. Yeah. And uh, my aims were to show what it was like to uh, meet my subject at different periods of his life, Saul Bellow or Kingsley Amos. But also, this is the harder bit, what it was like to be this person, uh, what the interior life of the person was like. And over and above this, uh, I wanted to show how brilliant the writing was, how, what a terrific writer he was. Uh, it's a big biography, and it follows a biography that was also very large, but Saul Bellow, my subject, was uh, famous quite early on in his life and had secretaries who kept every scrap of paper he wrote. And uh, to write this biography, I had to go through 350 boxes of papers at the University of Chicago Library, 150 of which were, were deposited in the library after Bellow's death. So though there was a substantial biography before mine, uh, I had access to materials the previous biographers uh, didn't. Um, Bellow was, uh, like Kingsley Amos, my previous subject, a very difficult uh, person. Uh, and um, he could be absolutely charming, and he could be have a whole series of human virtues, loyalty, uh, considerateness, and so forth. But he could also be very tough. And uh, my aim was to show uh, what kind of a person he was. And when people ask the question that they seem always to ask biographers, did you like him? My answer is always, I liked him when he was likable, and I didn't like him when he wasn't likable. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, Jenny Ugler, your uh, very distinguished, long and distinguished career as a biographer has covered quite a lot of different periods in uh, history. You've ranged over the centuries. So do you want to just touch on the sort of the variety and then say a little about Edward Lear? Um, yes, I, I, I've written a, a, about a different group, individuals and groups of people who look very different, um, going from the Restoration to uh, William Hogarth and the Prince of the 18th century, um, and then a group of uh, amazing scientists and thinkers in the middle of the 18th century, the Lunar Society, which was Erasmus Darwin, Josiah Wedgwood, Matthew Bolton and James Watt of the steam engine, and Joseph Priestley, and they were all very good friends. So that was a, a, a different kind of biography. The group biography. It was a, a group biography. It was trying to see how what they did, they wouldn't have done had they not been friends. And they were friends for 35 years all their lives. Um, but I've also written about 19th century uh, novelists um, and, uh, I, and, um, and an engraver, Thomas Buick, who was our first great wood engraver of nature, birds and things, for the, for the ordinary people. Um, and my most recent book's about Edward Lear. And they do look very different, but what they are, they're all the sort of odd um, individuals who don't quite fit in with... Uh, the society they're in, and who therefore very sharp and acute about seeing what's happening. Or uh, they all believe in change. They're radicals. They're nonconformists in all different senses. Um, and in the novel, e even if you're writing about a ruling monarch, yes. I, that, well, that's a, that is a story, <laughs> a, pu um, a published story, which writers may recognise. In that, after I'd written the Lunar Men about 18th century scientists. Um, I wanted to write about uh, an artist, and my publisher said, oh, no, 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 it's much too small. Um, uh, 
is there another period of history that you're interested in? And because I was interested in science, I, I was also interested in the restoration period where the Royal Society of London begins and the great scientific movement. So I said, well, I'm quite interested in the restoration. Um, and I found myself writing about Charles II. And I thought, well, it's good because for once I'm writing from the center, but then actually discovered that, that he was the most unkingly king yeah, sure. <laughs> that you could get. Um, so they're all about times of change and things, really. And, and just say a little bit more about Edward Lear, who yeah. was as peculiar a subject as one could hope to find Indeed. in biography. <laughs> yes. Um, well, Edward Lear, um, in Britain, is, I think a writer that we know and love from childhood for uh, The Owl and the Pussycat, you know, we probably all say it, and The Jumblies, and the, the funny limericks. Um, and uh, I, I think, I don't know about you, but a, a lot of biography or mine and it just comes from sheer nosiness. You, <laughs> you look at something, you think, where's that come from? How did they write? Who are they? Um, but then finding out about more about Lear was to realize that he's also uh, the most wonderful um, natural history artist, of, artist of birds and animals. And then after that, he wanted to be a landscape artist. So there are thousands of landscapes. And he traveled and traveled in order to do his landscapes, including spending 14 months in, in India in late life. So it's irresistible, really. <laughs> well, well, we'll maybe come back to his, his tour, his long tour of uh, India in a moment. Um, uh, Andrea, in your... Uh, Patrick, I've got to stop you. Oh, sorry, what about yeah. you? Oh, me? Yes. Me? Yes. <laughs> okay, we've had one person from the audience saying, yeah, yeah, but... Okay. <laughs> okay, more, all right. So, uh, well, so I, the, the last biography... <laughs> I'm not going to speak in uh, <coughs> Gujarati today. Um, so, the, the last biography that I did was of uh, V.S. Naipaul, uh, that was a book called The World Is What It Is, which came out uh, 10 years ago. And I'm now uh, researching and writing the biography of the novelist and Nobel Prize winner, Doris Lessing, uh, the only British woman so far to have won the Nobel Prize in literature. Uh, even though she grew up, she spent her childhood in southern Rhodesia, uh, now Zimbabwe, uh, then South Africa. So I'm, I'm sort of in, in the midst of, of doing that. And um, the, the only substantial difference I would say in writing this biography or researching this biography is that it's the first time I've done a biography of a woman. And the process of scanning the life and trying to see the life as a whole, you know, particularly since Lessing lived to the age of 94, uh, is quite different. Uh, there's an instinctive quality that perhaps you have when you write the biography of somebody of the same gender as yourself, which is different. It, it sort of, it makes you perhaps look a little harder and think about things a little, uh, a little differently. Um, but anyway, that again we can come back to. The, the question that I wanted to ask, which I think applies um, mainly to Andrea's book, is, is where you as the writer are in the book. So you actually had a personal connect with the story of Hemingway's trip to Italy, his interaction with Italy that led to uh, meeting Adriana, and she became this kind of super muse in his final years. So you, 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 you described the way that you actually met her yourself, and that she was a rather solitary, sad figure? Yes. <coughs> I, I, I had this childhood memory, but... All of this came to me uh, slowly, gradually. Uh, these were not uh, vivid memories stuck in my mind. But eventually I did remember that, that uh, I had met this, this uh, by then woman with whom Hemingway had, uh, had fallen in love. And when I met her, uh, she was uh, in her 40s. And she lived in Tuscany, not far from where we lived. And uh, uh, it was... Uh, not a, uh, we would so, uh, I'd sort of see her at Christmas cocktail parties, that, that sort of uh, level. So fairly superficial. But I did remember her uh, w looking, she was kind of always holding to her glass of whiskey and 
smoking a lot and always in a corner. And what struck me, what struck me was her sort of melancholy gaze. And, and then uh, uh, a few years later, I then heard that she had taken her life, m much uh, like Hemingway did uh, later on. And so this, this image uh, accompanied me uh, while I was writing uh, the book, obviously, um, because the, the two seemed uh, also s linked in this sort of tragic destiny, uh, uh, in a way, yeah. And uh, did, did you feel that made it a little difficult to have the distance, or were you glad that you knew some of the players in the story? No, no, it didn't, because uh, it wasn't that kind of close relationship that can come in the way of, of your writing. This was someone I had a, uh, about whom I had a recollection, and that recollection helped me. It also uh, gave me an entry into the family, and so gave me all sorts of contacts that were useful in a practical matter uh, for acceding to papers okay, and so stuff. Okay, so I mean, the, the practical side of biography, again, is something I'd like to talk about a little in a moment. Yeah. Um, but, Zach, if I can just ask you, um, when you uh, took on the uh, Kingsley Amos biography, having, I think, previously edited his letters, uh, there was always that moment where, you know, the, there's a, a thing when a biographer is appointed, to use the word that the press likes to use, of somebody who a lot of other people also want to write about. And uh, there was one of the sort of gossip journalist stories, which is that you were Martin Amos's tennis partner, and therefore you got the gig of doing his dad's biography. And uh, I just wondered if that was true, and whether it made any difference to the writing of the story. Um, I was his tennis partner and got the gig to edit his letters. Um, and. Um I, I'm just trying to prove that biographers are not sedentary people. We, we hop around tennis courts. Uh, yes, I, um, I got to play tennis with uh, um, Martin Amos. And then after I'd edited the letters, the question arose of who would write a biography. And he asked me if I'd do it. And I was very reluctant to do it because it had taken me five years to collect all these letters. and. Uh, annotate them and so forth, and I thought that was sort of enough uh, Kingsley Amos for me. But um, when it became clear that if I said no, I would have to hand over perhaps a thousand letters I'd collected but not included, mm. and the very detailed chronology uh, that was necessary for me to make sense of the letters, enough time had elapsed and uh, I felt I just couldn't give all this work to someone else. And I thought, all right, I'll, I'll do it. Um, and very glad I was, too. It was very interesting. It, um, I was an academic, not a biographer for a trade or general audience. And, um, and I had the sort of academics prejudices against biography that, you know, this is just narrative. Uh, where are the ideas? Uh, what, where's the interpretation and so forth? Um, and writing this biography, uh, us, one of a real pleasure of writing, it seemed to me, was to tell the story, to weave uh, different aspects of the personality into the text. And, um, and all my prejudices against biography dissolved. And um, I, I was very pleased I took it on. I, I, I'm guessing that with the ca in the case of Saul Bellow, there was a particular tension between how you treat the, the work how you treat the books and how you treat the uh, busy personal life um, yeah. in Bellow's case. And because his books are so substantial and so highly regarded, how did you decide to make that balance? Uh, the, well, it's very difficult, to, the balance between life and work if you're writing a, a literary biography. And especially one, as I said before, where my, one of my main aims was to make readers see what was uh, uh, wonderful, uh, beautiful, uh, brilliant about his writing. And, and finding the moment in which to stop the narrative and move into the writing and back out again was a, a, an in, in, interesting part of the, part of the job. Uh, I did want to say one thing about um, uh, I did meet Saul Bellow once. Yes. And um, I told him. <laughs> it's
it's not so bad to meet Saul Bellow. It, it's, not, it's not my fault. We, we'd arrange that, the timing. <laughs> anyway, I met him at a, a, a garden party in 1972 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it was a very hot day. And some people at this party were wearing shorts and Hawaiian shirts and so forth. And there was this man standing there wearing a brown silk suit and what I took to be a fedora hat. He was standing against a, sitting, leaning against a table that was surrounded by acolytes and uh, admirers. And I came up and uh, he looked very bored and very angry. It, I said I was a fan and shook his hand, but I, I never did anything. I never spoke to him, really, just to say hello. We walked away. And in the book, I say that um, this was a significant thing that Saul Bellow was so dressed up at this party when people were walking around in shorts and so forth. And I put this in the first volume of the biography. And I subsequently learned that this party was held on the day that Harvard gave its honorary degrees. And he had been a recipient of an honorary degree. And I'd made this little point about his character, which was quite wrong, because he, was, he had come directly from the ceremony. So it's But to, but to be fair, to he, he did take a great photograph, a and he was always he was beautifully dressed. He was a dandy, but in this particular case, he, he was licensed. So you were telling a larger truth, even if it wasn't factually accurate. <laughs> well, yeah. um, um, so, uh, Jenny, when we were speaking earlier, you were saying um, that you don't uh, approach biography theoretically. You sort of just get on and do it, which I think is you know, key to, to how, you, how you probably have written so many books that are so well-researched and well-written. But there's one thing that you do do, which maybe has a kind of subconscious theory behind it, which is that you provide um, what I've previously referred to as total context in relation to biography. And that is that you get the texture, the physical texture of the place, the people, the, clo the clothing, the surroundings, almost to the point where there's a filmic quality and you can feel that you are there in Restoration London before the Great Fire and there's a very tall Russian in a sable fur hat and he's got... Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're, 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 you're very keen on the physicality of the setting. So you might be talking about political history, social history, what that individual's journey is, but you want to make the reader present. I, yes, I do, but, um, but, but probably because that's, uh, I take great pleasure in that. Um, and I think that, first of about nosiness, it's, it's um, to me it's a, 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 a real mystery sometimes, how a, the, a work can come from a particular person. Um, and this seems like a sidetrack, but I wrote about Elizabeth Gaskell, Mrs. Gaskell, and she's a great gossip and a great letter writer and fantastically busy and had four children. And, and, uh, and at the most difficult, complicated time of her life, when she was being quite a nuisance to people, she wrote a wonderful short story of intense serenity and calmness. Um, and I wanted to know how it's called Cousin Phyllis, and it's like Turgenev or something. And I, I couldn't, I, I'm fascinated how those two come together. But, but as you say, to one thing that she said <laughs> um, when giving advice to a young writer, um, she said, don't think about planning the plot or anything, um, just see it. And this is Manchester in the mid-19th century. So she said, see it as if it was an accident in the street and describe exactly what you see in front of you. And as you do that, slowly, uh, good words will come. Um, and I, I think that uh, to me, no, um, try knowing a person, I am interested in what they had for breakfast or what they put on. And um, that I just like to, to see that and feel that. And that's part of the magic of doing it. I mean, it is, it, it's jolly difficult writing biography. <laughs> <laughs> but it has its intense pleasures, and they're often uh, the physical or, or a place or something like that, yeah. So I, I think that we've each come to biography by slightly different routes. Um, Andrea, in your case, going from journalism to biography, um, how easy was that process? What were the... The, the skills that you had to develop as a life writer 
in order to do that? Were they essentially the same as being a journalist that you collect information, you tell the story, or was the, the scale of biography ma making it in some way conceptually uh, different? I, th I think what I did was bring to, to uh, life writing the skills I had as a journalist and, and applied uh, them uh, to it. So essentially, when I'm writing about people, I'm really um, trying to get a story done. And, and the approach is essentially journalistic. You, you have a, uh, an inkling of something, you have an inkling of a story, and so you really go after it with a, a reporter's tenacity. Mm -hmm. And by this I mean that this is the way you conduct the research is really uh, a, a skill that you hold as a, as a reporter. Uh, the other thing is that, that, that I, I, I think um, uh, uh, comes from my background as journalist is this, this very strong desire to, uh, to get up and go to the places where the person I'm writing about uh, spent time or where important crucial moments uh, in his or her life occurred and you were always somehow rewarded by uh, in sometimes in unexpected can, can ways. Can you give an example of, of how by going to the physical location Well I can give you something. the example I mean the first example that comes to mind is in this uh, Hemingway book uh, there's a crucial place and a crucial moment in his life when he nearly loses his life. He's 18 years old. He's fighting in the trenches of World War I, and he is gravely wounded by an Austrian mortar uh, and then by subsequent machine gun uh, uh, bullets. Um, and obviously, I mean, he was 18 years old. He was a volunteer with the American uh, Red Cross. Uh, and so that event had to be important in his life. It was, he refers to it as the moment he lost his virginity and, and, uh, and became a man, right? Uh, and he says, there where you lose your virginity, there your heart will always beat. I think he was quoting Kipling. But um, anyway, um, so uh, he, when he comes to Italy and falls in love with this young uh, girl, he is also rediscovering the landscapes and the places and the trenches where he nearly lost his life 20 years before. And so he goes there repeatedly, uh, hoping for something to happen, right? Uh, and things do happen. He has, carries on this very strange ceremony. Uh, of, he, he, he finds the place in the bend in the river where uh, he was hit, and um, uh, he digs a little hole, and in this little hole, he, he buries uh, the pieces of shrapnel that he's been carrying all his life, um, and he buries them in the little hole. And then he pulls out a note, a bank note, and he puts it in the hole, and he says, this is a form of restitution to the Italian state for the tiny little pension that I received for my silver medal uh, back then. So an act of restitution. And finally, his third desire was to... Um, defecate in the hole so that he would leave something of his own body. Uh, now, this is very peculiar, but Hemingway was not a stranger to these sort of uh, arcane and very personal forms of um, uh, ceremonies. Uh, and so Did he complete the ceremony? Sorry? Did he complete the ceremony? Well, that's the point. Uh, he wasn't able to complete the ceremony in the sense that uh, he went into the bushes and nothing happened. He, uh, no bowel movement. And so he hung around. And the people he had gone there with also had to hang around waiting for something ha to happen. And it was getting dark and at a certain point it just got too late. And so he did not complete the, uh, the ceremony. Nevertheless, I thought it was a crucial place in his, in his life. And so I went there uh, and I went to the bend in the river and, um, and there, uh, it was the extraordinary thing is, because when he had gone, uh, he was with two other people. He was driving a fantastic royal blue uh, Buick uh, on, his, on his journey to the battlefields. And he sees a young boy uh, caulking a, a little boat in the river. This is the Piave, which is a very important river in the history of Italy. And he tells the boy, come on up, boy, and 
and bring me a shovel, no? And the shovel he needed to dig the little hole where he was supposed to do the right. Well, I'll be damned if I didn't meet the, the boy who had given him the shovel. And he is now 97 years old. And, um, and he was the one who, was, who, was, uh, who, who, who finally gave me a precise description of what happened that day. Because there had been very conflicting uh, descriptions in other books. And um, it was not clear whether this ceremony had ever taken place, whether it was a figment of Hemingway's imagination, like a lot of people thought. And here was an eyewitness uh, still alive to tell me, to tell me the, the, the tale. So the important thing is go to the places and things will happen. That's essentially the lesson I learned. <laughs> well, I don't know if anybody can uh, top that uh, Swatch uh, Italia story. But, um, <laughs> Zach, do you want to uh, take on this idea of the sense of place and the importance of going uh, to where yeah. the subject went? Yes. Um, well, I was always a little s skeptical of the sort of footsteps <laughs> tradition of biography. Um, I'm a great admirer of Richard Holmes, who, who talks about, uh, as you two do, the importance of going to the actual place. But I remember essay he wrote about Robert Louis Stevenson, and at a certain point, Stevenson talked about what a paradise Sacramento was in Northern California. It's no paradise today, I'll have you know. Um, so there are differences, but when I went to Chicago to go through Bellows' papers and to teach a course on his, on his fiction, wholly by accident, the housing service of the university found us an apartment in the same building he'd lived in for a dozen years, on the floor just above his. And the view out our window was his view. And the walk to teach the class and to my office was the walk he would have taken. And all that was really quite good for me. It, I did feel I was there. But there were hardships associated with going to the places he went to. He went to really terrible restaurants in Chicago. I mean, <laughs> ho horrible, enormous in, uh, Italian restaurants where all the food was covered in red sauce. And, um, and I think one of the important uh, um, uh, features of these restaurants for him was that he was known and, and greeted as professore and, and so forth. But uh, I'm very, very glad I did go there. I'm very glad I saw Bard College where he taught. I went to the place where he was born in Canada. Um, uh, I went to the places he wrote about in Europe, uh, in Tuscany, and, and so and forth. What about, what about with Kingsley Amis? Um, there was a hut at the end of the garden. Wait, d it d does the hut, hut survive, and what happened there? Uh, the hut doesn't survive. Kingsley Amis was, I mean, they were both notorious, I guess the phrase is womanizers. Um, and there's some story that Kingsley Amis was at a party uh, in Swansea at his house and uh, there was a hut in the back and he bedded all the women one by one who came to the party. I think this is an apocryphal story. I don't believe this uh, story is true. Um, Swansea was... Swansea was terrific. It wasn't quite... It wasn't quite a, an anti-glamour zone as it had been advertised for me, but the people I met were very nice and they did have memories of uh, Amos and his... Uh, chaotic but, uh, but attractive family. Um, but I went to places to interview people who were important in the story that were more exciting. I, I went to Costa Rica to interview one of his longest living friends, a, a man who died just uh, last year named Keith Botsford, who, uh, when I first uh, took this job on, I was told by, actually by Philip Roth, that he said, you know, Saul was not a, a monster, but he loved monsters, and you're going to have to go and interview them. And one of these monsters was this man, Keith Botsford, who lived in uh, Costa Rica, uh, the unfashionable part of Costa Rica called Cahuita. And I'm a very, I'm not an easy flyer. You had to, you had to take a little sort of propeller plane up over through San Jose to get there. And, and we landed on a sort of, cow field or something, and he was supposed to meet us. We only had a box, your post box number for him, and he wasn't there. Um, 
and finally a taxi driver said he thought he knew this man, Botsford, but it was 30 miles away. We got into this taxi and he was known by the natives in uh, Costa Rica as Kike. But when I got to the, he finally found the place, the beautiful house designed by his son who is a, an architect. At the front of the long drive was a big sign that just said on it, Kike, K-I-K-E. That had me a little worried uh, <laughs> at, at the beginning. Don't explain the cultural reference. Uh, Kike is, a, is a, a word for Jew, but it's not a very polite one. But they forgot to put the accent on the second, on the E at the, at the end. Anyway, he came out. He claimed he thought it was yesterday, but uh, 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 tomorrow that uh, we were arriving. He, he knew quite well when we were arriving. He, um, he'd been napping. He came out in red silk pajama bottoms and had gold earrings. He spent the whole time drinking Pepsi and smoking cigarettes. He stayed up all night. He took a disconcerting interest in my wife. Uh, and uh, he spent a very long time <laughs> telling me stories about himself. Who is in the audience, we should say. <laughs> telling stories about himself. And occasionally, he told stories about Saul Bellow. And in the course of uh, two, two, three days and two nights, he must have named a hundred books and places I had never heard of, um, some of which he'd actually read and been to. So, on balance, was it worth the, all the ordeal? I mean, did he give you did he give you the deliverable? He was absolutely the spitting image of his character in Humboldt's Gift, and so, in thinking about the extent to which Bellow drew characters from life. He helped in that way. Uh, he didn't help especially in his sense of, what, of, of the years he and Bellow spent together. Mm. They, he was altogether too central and unreliable a narrative. Um, Jenny, I think that the you know, sense of place is always ever present in your work. Um, I, I can't resist asking you about Edward Lear in India. D oh, did you, have you managed yes. to go to many of the places that he went to? No, I, I, I have followed his uh, travels, as it were, as much as I can in Europe and uh, um, uh, not quite in the Middle East. But, and, but coming to India, um, only, a l only a little bit. I feel I've only just touched. Um, Lear came to India uh, in his 60s with his indomitable um, servant, Georgia, who came from Albania originally in Corfu. And they traveled around... Uh, together, they in a, every form of transport. I mean, there were early trains and. And, and uh, what year was this? Uh, 1873. Um, uh, and um, they, they arrived in uh, Mumbai, Bombay, and Lear was ecstatic, as a lot of us are when we arrive at the colour and the scent and the elephants. And uh, Giorgio had always wanted to see an elephant, so. That was the first thing that Leah drew in India. To the, um, and then they went across to uh, Lucknow, and they went to uh, Calcutta and up the Ganges. They went to uh, Darjeeling in the south. They went down. They went to the Coromandel Coast and to Vandaju, Sri Lanka. I mean, they, they just cro crisscrossed and, and the hill stations. And so someday, yes, I'm going to do this. But the, uh, the two, there's almost, in a long life, this was... A, a a, a part of his life, um, and there's almost too much place in India, I'm afraid. For him, okay. <laughs> but but with, your, with your other subjects, are there times when you've been to the location where that person was living or having a formative moment in their life, and yeah. you've discovered or realized something that's changed the way you've written about that moment? Yes, and um, it, it's not... Uh, as, as you said, it's not a sort of practical, useful thing. It's something that often illuminates uh, how they work. Or anything. I remember uh, when I started writing about William Hogarth, who um, drew such amazing pictures of London life in the early 18th century, when the whole city was changing, it was a boom time. Everything was building, you know, the whole of the streets were full of building work and so on. And I went to where he was born, which is in Smithfield, just near St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And there was a huge, the Smithfield meat market and the fair of the Bartholomew Fair. Um, and, and as I went there, everything 
was there were cranes and there were lorries and there was building and there were new glass things going up and there was mess in the street and I thought well and that actually made me feel oddly how it would have felt to be a small child then but it, it translated as it were to now you know yeah um, so just before we, we start with um, some questions from the audience, I'd like each of you to say something about the practical process of how you go about writing biography. Um, I know that a lot of people are very curious about this. It's something that I often get asked, how do you do it? Uh, you know, what are the tips? What are the, what are the tricks? Um, so do you want to... Well, Zach, why don't you, why don't you uh, begin? Well, um, I was uh, advised by... A, a terrific biographer, a woman named Selina Hastings, when I embarked on the biography of Kingsley Amos, she said, um, here's what you do. You, you create four computer folders. One is chronology, and the second is people, and the third is themes, and the fourth is works. And when I set off to Chicago to go through these 350 boxes of papers, when I came across an interesting fact or an odd date and so forth, I put it in its appropriate uh, file inside the folder. So that at, at certain points in the narrative when you want to stop and talk about uh, Saul Bellow's attitude, say, to Freud, you have things he said about Freud in correspondence and essays through, throughout his life, as well as in bits of the novel. Just make a little note of where it is, so that you don't want to stop the narrative for too long, but when you want to speak more generally of what he felt about Freud, there you had at your fingertips this material. The other thing, the other part of this work, aside from going through the papers, was interviewing people. And this was with not without its dangers. Um, I remember that the first person I interviewed, after I interviewed him, he said, well, who else are you going to see? And I said, I'm, I'm going to see A. Um, and he said, well, Saul thought A was a finger puppet. And then when I went to see A, he said, who have you seen? And I said, well, I've seen B. He said, Saul thought B was a nebbish. And they, they probably were both right, but it wasn't the whole story. And interview is, interviews can be, can be tricky, but I enjoyed doing them quite a lot. And my advice to anyone who does interviewing for this sort of work is to begin by asking your subject all about uh, his or herself. Uh, th that's something they know about, and they calm down, and it makes subsequent interviews easier. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Andrea? Um, well, again, I think it has to do with my background and the approach. I, I mean, I don't write full-length biographies from beginning to end. So I don't think I would be capable. I don't think I have the necessary discipline and methodology and folders. And I, I, I'm, I'm just not that kind of person. I, I've... I've always been a reporter, really, and so I, I, I scribble down things in notepads and stuff them in my pocket and uh, keep a very uh, cluttered uh, desk uh, because what I'm after is really a story uh, rather than uh, trying to, to draw a full-length portrait of someone. And so the approach is very different. And so I really kind of discard uh, everything that is not pertinent to the to the story, I use the word story in a sort of journalistic way. Uh, of of uh, in this particular case, in the Hemingway case, the story was, of course, well, this 50-year-old falling in love with an 18-year-old. How the hell are they going to manage this relationship in the glare of publicity? You know, he was a very famous man back then, and so so it was a big load for her, for this young girl. Uh, it was. He was taking on extraordinary responsibilities. And so my principal curiosity was, you know, how is this going to pan out? How are they going to manage this? This is going to, um, uh, you know, take us to, uh, to places and we'll see the relationship uh, develop. But ultimately, we want to know 
how it's going to be uh, dealt with. And so it's really in the service of that idea of that quest that I organized the gathering of the, of the material. But essentially, it was uh, a, you know, a reporter's work that, that I think. Jenny, do you have folders? No. <laughs> um, I, I, I suppose I spend a long time just immersing myself in the work and I might write little things. For, for me, I, I, so, so there are always people who, uh, I like to be familiar with that body of work so that you know, I'm not walking on sand. But after that, it's the structure of, 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 and how to take people through a story. Sometimes I don't often always write full biographies or it's a moment. Um, and and, and do you research, do the research and the writing at the same time or not? No, I, I do a, a lot of the research first and, and I, read the let, I read the letters. Um, and again, I make notes um, and I keep copies of the letters and I go to archives and I sit and I think. But, but then it, after I've got the, the, the structure right, um, I, I just start writing and sometimes it's in the middle, but sometimes it's at the beginning. But there's usually a moment that triggers it, it's like being full up to here, uh, and you think, oh, I've actually got to write it. And, and so it's a, a strange process. But, but the structure, too, isn't very logical. Um, Thomas Buick grew up by the Tyne, and uh, um, as a small boy, he saw the birds on the river. Um, and so the river seemed a completely natural form for the book to, to take. Yeah. So I, I think I, I would tend to, to share much of... Uh, um, what Zach was describing as a, as a technique of accumulating the material. The only bit of additional advice uh, which I remember receiving from uh, another great biographer, Michael Holroyd, was do all of that cataloging, do the files, the folders, the chronology, the themes, the subjects, but your best idea of the story, your best idea of the narrative comes from memory. So have it all cataloged away but it's what you're remembering as being the exciting and important information that ends up making the, the narrative. So I think that when you get stuck with a, with a book, with a non-fiction book, particularly a, bi a big one, it can be useful to not look at the material and instead just to sit down and think, well, you know, what, what was the next interesting and important thing that this person uh, did? Um, all right, so we'll now have time for some um, questions from the audience. Yeah. So we'll maybe take a couple of questions. And if you'd like to say who you are before you, uh, before you speak. Good afternoon. My name is Nidhi. I'm a ninth standard student. So my question was, there can be, you know, basically two parts which can give you an urge to write a biography, which is one can be your personal interest towards a particular person or else your social responsibility, which you feel as a personality, as a well-known personality that you want other person who has done something great, which you want to share with the people, with other people. There can be these two factors. So which among them leads you to write a biography? Is it your innate urge or, you know, is it your personal feelings towards a person or you know, your affection towards a person or else it's your social responsibility that you want other people also to know about this particular person? Okay, let's take one more uh, question. There was somebody on this side. Yeah, yeah, you. No, this, this lady here, sorry. Yeah. Hi, oh. <laughs> Hi I'm Shubhika. I'm a management consultant based out of Delhi. Uh, my question to you is, how do you decide on a subject? Uh, what, what character intrigues you? What character personality intrigues you? And is there some way along the line you feel the materials of level probably is not enough to write? Or do you want to switch the subjects? I want to know the research part. Okay, let's just take a supplementary question from this gentleman who had the mic. Should I, should I ask? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Patrick, uh, this question may not be related, completely related to biography. But uh, I am searching, uh, I'm so searching uh, an answer from so many people. As you know, we have been celebrating uh, 150 years of Gandhiji. Uh, so I have one, two questions in my mind. So, so many people have written biographies on Gandhiji, but none of 
all these people who have written this, they have not mentioned the two incidents which happened in the life of Gandhiji. One is his relationship with the boy, Kellen, Bok, Kellen Beck, and another one is his relationship with uh, Sarladvi, uh, where he wanted to get married uh, after 50 years or 60 years. So thank, can thank you, you give me the answer, yeah. please? Thank you. Okay, I think th th this is a book that you may yourself have to write. I mean, there have been so many books on Gandhi, but we've seen with the Ramchandra Guha book, there's always more information about Gandhi um, yet to come. Uh, perhaps I can, can ask you all to comment on those two uh, earlier questions, both of which, in a way, cover the same thing of how you choose your, your subject. Um, I... I choose my, I, I'm not, um, sounds, I'm not conscious of choosing my subject. Um, very often there are a lot of books that I would like to write. Um, but at, at different times, I am particularly interested in, in something. So I had been working on the 19th century, early 19th century, and always looking back to see where that came from, what about their parents, what about so on. So I found myself th wanting to know about the 18th century, and that's to, to know about it, I was looking at Hogarth's prints, and I thought, what an extraordinary person. So, so and nearly all the people I've written about have come by that kind of accident. Um, uh, some child remembering how peculiar the Lunar Society was. Who are they? So, so I'm afraid it's rather and, accidental. And what about Nidhi's question about whether there should be a social function in writing biography? Um, well, I think a social, a, a social function is that of giving, uh, of, of passing on information. Maybe it's, in some cases it's important to know, to have new insight into people and their achievements. Um, at other times, it's, it's, as Andrea said, it's storytelling. It's something that fascinates you. So the only social function is that actually of giving. You know, you, you say, this is amazing. You, I want other people to, to know it. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, you do say, this is amazing, and I think it would be interesting for you all to, to know about this. Yeah. And in that sense, there is a, yeah. a social uh, element yes. uh, to it. I mean, yes. it... it uh, um, I remember I, I wrote a book, a, a biography about my great 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 grandmother. There's there's no reason why anybody should read a book uh, about my great 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 grandmother. But on the other hand, uh, it was through her eyes and who through her writing that I was able to really understand a very complicated period of history, which was the Napoleonic. Napoleonic Europe, yeah. and I'd never been able to figure it out. It was so complicated and never changing. And here I had, finally, a very intelligent, very articulate woman who lived through this whole period and saw it through her eyes, and finally uh, I was illuminated by, by it. And I thought, oh my God, this is, this is so good and so interesting. I'm going to I'm going to write about her life because through her eyes I can understand so much. I, th I think, Zach, in, in, in your two big biographies, you do get a sense rather in the way that you do perhaps in a, a sort of fat 19th century novel, you do get a sense of the complexity of humans and the way they interact with each other. I think with both Amos and Bello, there are moments when you think, did you really do that? Uh, what did she say? Uh, how could you? Uh, so, you know, the, the, the complexity, good and bad, of how humans interact with each other, I think perhaps does fulfill a social function. Well, I, yes. And, um, but I also, I mean, I start from the fact that um, I think the writing is terrific. Both quite different writers, Amos and uh, Bello, but both brilliant. And uh, I wanted to, the, social, the main social function was to bring to readers a taste of the pleasure these writers can give you and to send them back to the, to the writing. Yeah. Along the way, I would hope that the account I gave of their lives was itself pleasurable to read. And it was only when I became a biographer that I thought I had any claims as a writer, as it were. If you're an academic, any amount of elaboration and uh, uh, and I don't know, and inside jargon and so forth is permissible, 
and I wanted to reach a general audience to get them to read these terrific, these terrific writers. So that those social functions, yes, yeah, so the and behind it all was a the what grows out of an appreciation of the writing for me is the wonder of how it got written. What kind of a life was led to produce this kind of work? And if it's dispiriting to discover that the insight and human wisdom in the works was not reflected in the life, then you've learned something about the world. I mean, I, I do remember thinking in the case of um, both Francis' young husband, who that was the first biography I wrote, and with V.S. Naipaul, that they were a way of telling a story. They both offered a way of telling a story about imperialism and its effect on the individual. Uh, in the case of young husband, the preponderance of personally bizarre, psychologically bizarre figures in the later stages of uh, British global imperialism in the late 19th, early 20th century. It was a kind of representative quality to France's young husband's story. And again, I think with, with Naipaul, some of the, uh, the psychic damage of imperialism, the triangulation between his ancestral homeland of, of northern India, uh, Gorakhpur, the area of, in, in northeastern UP, uh, then growing up the first 18 years of his life in Trinidad, in a very colonial setting, a good colonial school, and then suddenly aged 18 being transplanted to Oxford and spending the rest of his life um, in the United Kingdom. So the, the, the dislocation of empire, uh, I felt in both cases, could be told through the personal individual stories in a biography in a way that might not have been, been possible in a regular history book. Um, I think we've got time for two more questions. So we'll take one at the front. And just one, okay, and, w and one at the back, okay. Please be quick, you're only allowed to, uh, 10 words. Uh, Saul Bellow was thought to be a, a bit of a layabout by his family. His brothers who bullied him all his life till he gained possibly the Nobel Prize. Can, how did it influence his writing? And can you tell us a little okay. more about the Thank you, was family? Saul Bellow a layabout? And you, madam, I think also have a question. Families always say stuff like that about writers. You shouldn't take it too seriously. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask that when you write a biography about someone, uh, I, most people tend to feel a slight inclination to romanticize or even defend the character. So is that a pitfall you allow yourselves to fall into, or do you avoid it? How do you Great avoid Great question. It? Should you defend the character? Um, uh, no. I, I don't know about defense, but I, I, I do know that there is a tendency you get too close and not necessarily romanticized, but, um, and certainly this happened to me with Elizabeth Gaskell. I was reading some letters uh, from uh, the daughter of someone supposed to be her great friend, and this daughter said, oh, that woman's coming to stay again. My mum can't stand her, you know? And I, th and I felt it as if it was a personal affront. And at that point, you think, no, you know, stand back. So I, I think that the m when you are with somebody over a long period of time, um, you be understanding can lead to uh, sympathy, but it, it shouldn't uh, cloud your judgment. Okay, yeah. final sentence from each of you. Uh, a question to you all. All our books are based on boxes and boxes of correspondence. What is the future of biography? Oh my God, we need <laughs> another one hour for that. <laughs> the future of biography is that people are going to have to have a lot of WhatsApp message decoding. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, well, if you, uh, I mean, I'm sure there are people out here who know this. Uh, if, you, uh, if you gain a name as a writer now, uh, a large library will buy not just all your papers, but your hard drives and uh, yeah. so forth, and their there are ways of preserving this, this material. Uh, it will make it even harder, is the, <laughs> the answer, I think. Yeah. Well, well thank, yeah. thank you Maybe, to um, Zachary I'm Leader, Jenny Uglo, and Andrea de Robland. We now have to leave the stage, and thank you to the audience. Thank you all so much. That was a wonderful session. Uh, we do want to present you with some scarves before you go. <laughs>